And we're back. You are listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. And if you don't have Fight Now in your sports channel lineup, you need to call your local television provider and tell them that you want Fight Now right now. It's that simple. Pick up the phone and call. For all the information about the channel, you can find it on their website, www.fightnow.com. And speaking of now... Well, you know that intro. It's time for In the Ring with uh, Billy C. and Steve Lott. And speaking of Steve Lott, he joins us from beautiful Las Vegas right now. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Billy. It's nice and chilly here. I hope it's better up there in the Northeast. Uh, well, you know, it's uh, chilly to me is uh, not like chilly to you out there, that's for sure. But uh, uh, hopefully I'm going to be uh, enjoying that weather soon enough. Um, welcome to the show again today. Uh, some things I wanted to talk to you about. You know, injuries seems to be plaguing uh, the sport, uh, at least in this day and age. And, you know, I'm, I'm reading about, oh, this fight's canceled, this one's rescheduled, and we're, we're hearing about little bruises and deep bruises in, in hands and shoulder injuries and toenail clipping injuries and all of this stuff. And, and it got me thinking. You know, back in the day, I know that there were a lot of injuries, but were there a lot of cancellations due to injury? Uh, I'd be hard-pressed to think of any major ones, uh, with the exception, of course, of the famous uh, Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay uh, delay when he uh, had the hernia surgery after the first Clay Liston fight. Uh, other than that, it was very rare that fights were canceled for injuries, uh, they were canceled outdoors mostly for rain, snow, and sleet. Uh, the second Lewis Walcott fight was postponed because of rain at, at the stadium. So very rare back then. Of course, the focus now with television and the Internet and everyone knowing what's happening, in, whether it's in London or Las Vegas, right away, th there may have been uh, cancellations back then, but they were on a much lower level than they would be today, and you just never heard about them. Well, you know, it, it always, you know, we always go back to preparation, you know, with the older fighters compared to today's. And even back then, the training methods were a lot more, well, what we're going to call, you know, primitive. But back then, it was the way they did it, you know, the old chopping of the wood, the running up the in, uh, hills in, in, uh, in uh, military boots and what have you. Um, it would, I would think, I mean, I'm not a, a training expert or anything, but I would think that, that those types of training methods would be more taxing to the body than, than the way they train today. What, what do you think? Well, obviously, uh, they're much different. Uh, I would say they're probably, well, probably more traumatic. You know, chopping a tree, uh, it, it looks good, and it uh, uh, sounds good, and it impresses people, but it's hopelessly inconsequential to fighting or boxing or anything like that. It would be the same thing today if you uh, spoke to a professional football trainer today and said, what do you think about chopping trees or, or hitting a tire with a hammer? Uh, he'd look at you and say, you know, you're out of your mind. He'd say, weightlifting is probably pretty good because we have to be stronger and running track, but chopping a tree, it has nothing to do with, with, with the boxing. I don't know what uh, training methods they do today with fighters outside of the weight training and running and resistance training, that's not traumatic. That, again, really has very, very little effect on a fighter. If you get hit, you're going down. It really doesn't increase punching power that much. It may make the fighter feel better emotionally or psychologically. But I would take a Joe Lewis or Jack Dempsey or Rocky Marciano without any training methods today over any of these guys. Well, that's my point. I mean, the, you know, the, the Rocky Marciano made it, you know, uh, kind of uh, not that they all didn't do it. James Jeffries, uh, you know, took hunting trips and climbed mountains and hunted and fished, and that was his way of training. But it seems like it, it, it made these guys, I don't want to say stronger, but definitely tougher. You know, I, you, know you, you read today about a guy that has all the, the money and all the advanced uh, training techniques, and yet he still you know, gets one of those deep bruises that causes the fight to, to, to you know, be postponed. 
I, it just makes me wonder if some of the methods today scientifically don't seem better. I mean, uh, scientifically do seem better, but maybe in reality they're not. Well, it's a couple of things. Number one, the uh, physicians that hang around the fighters today, they're much more prolific, prolific than they were back then. The uh, uh, fighters back then did not have their personal physicians. Guys walked into the ring in the teens and 20s and 30s with one eye blind, you know. So it's a lot different today with a physician and the commissions looking at every single thing. And as you said, it was much tougher back then. Life was much tougher in the teens, the 20s and 30s, the guys growing up in the ghettos. Uh, once a fighter gets to be proficient today and in the public eye, um, there's going to be more scrutiny on him, and, you know, he's going to be more careful about jeopardizing his career if he has a bruise. So I think they're mu you're right. They're much too careful today. Yeah, you know, and, and going back to some of the footage that, that you reviewed over the years, did you ever, does any one stick out or several stick out in your mind where you're watching that fight and all of a sudden you, you, you say to yourself, oh, yeah, he just hurt his hand. Uh, So-and-so just clearly hurt his hand. And then, you know, you notice uh, favoring that hand during the fight or, or uh, were fights ever stopped because of injury like they are today? Well, the one of the most famous, of course, is uh, Jake LaMotta uh, fighting Marcel Sudan. Uh, for the uh, middleweight championship, and um, in the first round, at the end of the first round, Sudan, the champion, dislocated his shoulder, and for the rest of the next seven rounds, threw only punches with only one arm. Now, you'd think the physician at ringside would come in there and say, what's going on, and let's stop the fight. That's how tough the guys were. One of them that I've never seen, that uh, was never filmed, was um, uh, a famous story that Customato told me. Bo Jack was one of the great uh, lightweight champions of all time. He was fighting at Madison Square Garden and broke his leg in the ring and hobbled after the opponent for the next couple of rounds. Now, uh, that's one film I'd have loved to see. It, it probably happened. It may have happened. But that's the type of story you'd love to hear about in boxing. Yeah, and like you said, it would be great to see it. I got a little story I've shared with uh, my listeners over the years. Every time the Jake LaMotta uh, fight with uh, Marcel Serdan comes up, that scene when they were filming Raging Bull, uh, who did that? Scorsese? Was that? Uh, was that yes. Scorsese yes. was trying to get that fall that uh, uh, that uh, Marcel Serdan, uh, you know, basically got thrown to the canvas uh, by Jake LaMotta in that first round. It was trying to get that fall perfect uh, for the movie. And the guy who played Marcel Serdan happens to have a connection to this show. His name, I forget his first name, but his last name was Raftus. His son used to make our, our shirts and what have you. Anyway, he was the guy. He was actually an active, uh, undefeated welterweight out of, uh, out of New York. And he kept falling on his shoulder. Nope, redo it, redo it, redo it. And finally, when the, when the, uh, when the, the take that, that they used in the film, when it finally happened perfectly, guess what? Raftus separated his shoulder, and his career was ruined from that movie. Oh, man. Yeah, you well, know, well, what, what yeah, a connection, it, it, right? It, 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 there's no expression, life imitates art, <laughs> and sometimes it's not, not, too, not too good. Right, I know, I know, but uh, I remember Eli, who's the son, he was telling me the story, and I'm like, you're kidding me, right? I never knew, but uh, anyway, you know, uh, speaking of injuries and stuff, you know, one thing uh, that, that uh, sticks out with me, too, is today the way sparring is used. You know, back in the day, from what I understand, I know, um, you, you know, you, you didn't get too much uh, opportunity to review sparring uh, on film. But back in the day, uh, sparring sessions were, were a, a good gauge to, to really test your fighter. Today, I'm not so sure it's the same. Uh, they, they bring in a guy for sparring, and let's say they want to work on defending against a jab, let's just say, for argument's sake. They'll tell that sparring partner, okay, today you're going to be throwing jabs all day, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, what they're, they're working on with, with the fighter. But I'm not so sure it helps the fighters the way sparring used to, you know, when they used to have those knockout, dragout fights and, and fighters actually got better from sparring. What's your thoughts? Well, you're absolutely correct. Uh, let's take football, for example. Uh, when two, uh, the team practices, the coach doesn't say, okay, you linemen, you're not going to do anything right now. You're going to let this guy just do his thing. No. 
what happens is they play exactly the way they would in a real game. They call exactly the same plays. They call exactly the same runs. What you do in practice is what you do best for the real thing. Now, I've seen a lot of training camps, and usually the, the uh, sparring is, is normal sparring. There's no particular I jab, you jab, but they don't spar at a high enough level. They don't try to emulate or duplicate exactly what's going to happen in the fight. In the teens, 20s, and 30s, they did more of that. They did more of doing exactly in, in sparring what they would do in the real ring, uh, in, in the real fight, especially guys like Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey, the guys that were filmed most often. In Tyson's training camp from 85, 86, 87, when I was there, the sparring sessions were better than world title fights. Kevin Rooney demanded that Mike do exactly what he would do in the real fight. The bombs, there were sessions with Mike Tyson and Oliver McCall and Mike Tyson and Jesse Ferguson sparring that you'd say, this should be on pay-per-view. That makes the fighter more proficient when he has to do the real thing. There's no difference. There's no upgrading. There's no setting his mind to say, I have to do better or harder. What you do in practice is what you do in the real fight. Yeah, and, and it amazes me that more fighters, and well, I should actually, I'm not going to blame the fighters, more trainers don't follow that approach because, you know, uh, we, we can see the results of, of, of poor sparring or, or uh, maybe maybe that's a bad choice of words or light sparring or or somebody you know I've talked to sparring partners that that get brought into a camp and uh, they'll say well all, all we want you to do is X Y Z don't 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 go after our guy don't hurt him don't do this you know we just basically want you to be a a moving punching bag and and I can't see where that really helps the fighter. It, it doesn't, uh, of course, in the teens, twenties, thirties, uh, the fighters fought like that and the trainers fought like that in in sparring. For no other reason, that's the way you do it. Today, if a sparring session in a, in a you know contenders camp or champions camp, if it gets too out of hand, the trainer is very concerned about the fighter getting hit and getting cut and the fight being postponed. That's his thinking process. Instead of teaching his own fighter to move his head, fight harder in sparring, move his head and not get hit, which would be much better for the fighter in a fight, they, 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 they slow up on the sparring, you know. Now, of course, their fighter is a world champion, so he's going to do okay in the real fight anyway. But that doesn't work if you have a young kid you're trying to teach. That's why it's important for teachers, for trainers, to teach their kid to move their head so that in sparring they can fight much harder, and that prepares them for the real fight. Yeah, it, it, it makes more sense to have better sparring sessions because, you, you know, if your fighter doesn't do well and, and he loses that day in sparring, you know, he gets to come back and improve and work on the things that he was not working well with and not affect his, his professional record, you know. So today, they're, they're, I don't think they're utilizing sparring. I'll give you an example. I don't know if you caught the fight recently, but the, we have a young uh, heavyweight uh, named Deontay Wilder, and uh, he was our last uh, medal winner a couple years back or what have you, and, and he's amassed quietly a, a 26-0 and 0 with 26 knockout record against, you know, the proverbial uh, tomato can. I mean, not one recognizable fighter has, has been on his resume. So he, he fought recently and uh, once again knocks out his opponent, his overmatched opponent, and they're trying to talk him up, and they say, well, he's been in sparring camps with, you know, Klitschko and this guy and that guy, impressive names. And I said to myself, that that's what prompted me to ask you, because I started thinking, you know, yeah, but what's he learning if they're telling this guy only to do one or two things to help and to benefit the, the guy he's sparring with? You know, I, I think it hurts both of them in that case. Well, um, I, I've not seen that sparring, so we don't know. Uh, to what extent he's been told to hold back in any way. Uh, the other thing about sparring very, very hard or making it almost or exactly like a real fight, uh, it gives the fighter much more confidence to know that when he walks into the fight, the real fight, he's got something in his well. He knows that he's done this in sparring over and over and over, especially if a, a fighter is a, is a very fine fighter or a champion, for the trainer to take the sparring partner out after two rounds and put a fresh one in, and then the next two rounds put a fresh one in. For the fighter who's challenging for the championship or the champion, he gets so much more confidence knowing 
here he is in training fighting a fresh guy every two rounds. When he goes in to defend his title against the other guy, he knows the other guy's not doing that. Every chance you get to give your fighter confidence, that helps tremendously. That's as much or more important than running another five miles. Uh, it's 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 amazing, uh, uh, you know, the differences between, uh, you know, generations. You know, I, I wanted to talk to you a little about, uh, getting off the, this subject, I wanted to talk to you a little about Ezra Charles. You know, uh, this is a guy that... Uh, uh, a lot of people have virtually forgotten, and, and you know, people remember him as, as a heavyweight champion and, and what have you. But this guy was uh, really effective as a middleweight and light heavyweight. As a matter of fact, at, at one point in time, he was a, a devastating puncher until uh, uh, a mishap in the ring uh, caused uh, the death of an opponent, and, and he vowed uh, uh, to, uh, to change his style, which he did. What can you tell us about Ezra Charles based on some of the footage you saw? Well, uh, fortunately, footage exists, so that's great. Unfortunately, very little exists from the 40s when he was coming up as a middleweight and, and light heavyweight. Uh, his fights were starting to be filmed once he fought uh, Jersey Joe Walcott uh, for the title, and he won a decision. And uh, the second fight, again, the third fight with Walcott was a sensational fight, ending with Walcott winning. I think Ezard is most remembered for his two fights with Rocky Marciano. The first fight was a war, 15 rounds of, of war. And it showed you that a guy like Ezra Charles, not really a full-fledged heavyweight, can stay in there with Rocky Marciano for 15 rounds. And his, he, he was a terrific puncher. Uh, Marciano, of course, was the, the sensational heavyweight champion. Uh, but that era was, was chock full of great fighters. And between Walcott and Joe Lewis, who came out of retirement to, uh, to fight Charles for the championship. And Rocky Marciano, uh, it's very tough to, to really be stand out in that era. But his fight with Marciano was the one that showed me he was sensational. They had a rematch uh, six months later, and Charles got knocked out, and that was relatively the end of his, his career. But the Marciano fights showed me he was a great fighter. You know, I... It's funny how every generation always looks at the previous one uh, as the last great era, and, and I always, you know, remind people that even though today we look at the, you know, Ali era, the the '60s and '70s as one of the greatest heavyweight eras, during that time, you know, boxing fans were complaining about it. They were they were longing for the days of Rocky Marciano. Um, it, it's kind of uh, it, it's kind of funny, but there was one thing that was constant, um, and and this actually was brought up by a listener recently. There was one thing that was constant in, in both those two eras that I decided to pick in the in the fifties and sixties. There were a lot of what we call journeyman heavyweights out there um, that were good. They were talented. They were they were a gauge for your fighter. I mean, you had to beat these guys to to move on to the next level. And uh, they were tough, and sometimes they won, and, and, you know, their career was alive for another day. We don't have that today, Steve. What we have is we have one extreme or the other. You have the, the champion, and then you have the, the tomato can. There's, like, nobody in between. Do you see that? I mean, is, is that something that boxing really needs, those, those tough guys that, that are, are a gauge and, and make, uh, uh, make the boxing game a little more interesting? Well, that would be wonderful. There's a specific reason why that's not possible. Uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, baseball, football, basketball was not nearly as big as it was today. So a kid in the 30s or 40s or 50s, if, if he's uh, uh, 15 years old, 6'1", six, 6'2", six, and uh, he's strong, and he's living in Detroit or, or Des Moines or somewhere, boxing was huge. So he's going to go to the local gym and start boxing. Maybe, maybe high school football, basketball, baseball. But boxing was the standout sport, the Joe Lewis sport, the Rocky Marshall sport, the Jack Dempsey sport. That was the one to go into. Now, if the kid is 14, 13, 14, 6 1, 6 2, he's tremendously in good shape. He's played some sports. He ain't going to go into boxing, he's going to go into the flamboyant sports. His dad is going to drive him over to the local junior high school, and they're going to look at the beautiful baseball field, or they're going to look at the beautiful football field, or they're going to look at the beautiful basketball arena. And the father may say, may say, uh, son, you know, if you're a heavyweight champion in five or six years, 
you can make more in one fight than you could in a whole year as a football player. Let's take a look at the uh, uh, the gym, the boxing gym. They drive 10 miles downtown to a dark, dirty, spit bucket gym, and the kid looks around and says, no, Dad, uh, let's stick with football, baseball, basketball. So the kids who could be very fine heavyweights today, who could be 6'2", 6'3", 210, 230, 240, they're not boxing. They're playing junior high school football, baseball, basketball. For guys who were not good enough to be junior high school baseball, football, basketball kids, they're the ones who went into boxing, and they're the tomato cans. If they couldn't make it on those teams, they're not going to make it in boxing. No, great point. And the other thing, too, is a young boy, uh, uh, you know, he's checking out those fields, and he sees all the hot cheerleaders, too. There's no cheerleaders in those stinky gyms, right? That's another major factor. And his friends are there, and the girls are there, and it's right there at the gym, and it's beautiful. Boxing's a very tough sport. That's why the little guys today are so many of them, because they can't play baseball, football, basketball. They're too small. Yeah. So that's why you have the Pacquiao's and the Mayweather's and the Nairs. These guys are the best of the best. Uh, uh, so, uh, but we're not going to see that in the heavyweight division, especially here in, in this country. No, great point. Hey, listen, I got one more question for you. Uh, uh, one of our episodes, we were talking about all-time great fighters and uh, uh, you know, uh, you were settling a debate, except uh, actually you didn't settle anything because you picked a guy that nobody else picked. But it got me thinking, and I got an email recently that was really interesting. And, uh, you know, although I'm not, uh, I'm trying not to talk about Floyd Mayweather as much be in unless he's relevant to, uh, to the sport in terms of, you know, having a fight scheduled and everything else. I got a really good in uh, email from a listener. He wanted to know what fighters I felt, he, he asked me to name three, what fighters I felt could have beaten both Floyd Mayweather Jr. and Manny Pacquiao if we had the time machine and they went back. And it was easy for me to name uh, uh, a couple off the top of my head. I, I thought that Sugar Ray Robinson would beat both of them, and uh, I, I also uh, felt Henry Armstrong would beat both of them. But instead of giving them three, I picked, uh, I picked three more from my third one, and I picked three guys from the 80s. I, I picked Sugar Ray Leonard, I picked Tommy Hearns, and I picked your guy, Roberto Duran. And I used him as an explanation when I was explaining how good a young Roberto Duran was. What's your thoughts? Would Roberto Duran have beaten both Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao if, if they fought at, let's say, uh, a junior welterweight? Um, I, my answer would be yes. Um, with with uh, Pacquiao, it probably would have been an easier fight uh, because uh, Duran, the uh, young Duran, was much slicker than people thought he looked like. While he was a tremendous puncher and very vicious, he slipped punches very well, he was in your face all the time, and the fights that he fought early on, he got hit with tremendous shots and kept coming back. That would have been the easier of the two fights. The tougher one against Mayweather is because Mayweather is what you call a stinker-type fighter. He hits and moves and hits and moves, and he turns his shoulder. The, you know, it's the type of fighter, it's almost like fighting a little bit uh, uh, like a, uh, a, a shooter letter type fighter. He does not want to stand right in your face until late in the fight when you're both standing toe-to-toe. -to -toe. So that would have been a tougher fight, Duran against Mayweather. But the difference is that May uh, Mayweather is not as vicious as Duran from the opening bell. He's very conservative. Duran from the opening bell, he wants to kill you. And that would have been an interesting thing to see on Mayweather's side, what type of effect that would have had on him, not only the viciousness, but the punches coming also. So I agree that Durant would have beaten both of them. Yeah, and what I use as an example is I say, you know, you, you got to look at Durant, the 10 years he fought before Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, everybody has a tendency to remember the No Mas fight and, the, you know, that era of Durant, and then that extra career that he had after uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, but his viciousness... And his domination was, was the years prior. And, and the fight I always tell people to watch, I, I say, listen, you want to know about Roberto Duran? Go back and watch the 1972 fight against uh, uh, Kenny Buchanan at Madison Square Garden. That is the Roberto Duran that would have destroyed most lightweights. Yes. Uh, one of the mistakes that the, the uh, boxing uh, reviewers and guys and people look at when they look back at fighters, you really shouldn't look back at the tail end of their careers. 
so Dempsey would have been before the Tunney fights, and, and Marciano, of course, was during his heyday. Uh, Joe Lewis, really, before the Ezra Charles fight, up to the second walkout fight. Tyson, 85, 86, 87, you can't go after he came out of prison. Cassius Clay, his incredible years from 64 to 68 before the draft. It's really unfair for any of those guys to be measured after the height of their careers. So the same with, with Duran. It's that 72, 73, 74, 75 era where he was a sensational fighter. And if he was around today, uh, HBO would, would lock him in the room and wouldn't let him leave until he signed the contract. But uh, that's the type of fighter he was. He was sensational. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. Well, listen, brother, another great, uh, great episode with you, and uh, we look forward to the next one. If I don't talk to you uh, before the holidays, make sure you have a great holiday, and uh, we'll be looking forward to a strong new year, brother. Thank you. Send all your fans to the Boxing Hall of Fame here in Las Vegas. Is everything up and running? Are you going to get me the links? You want me to set it up on the website? You got you to gotta get me that? Yes. Okay. I will, get you, I will get you everything. All right. Sounds good. As soon as you get it, I'll have it up there, man. Anything, you. anything else uh, you, you want to mention about, the, uh, about your uh, Hall of Fame, about the La Las Vegas Boxing Hall of Fame? It's up and running, and now the website will be really sensational with all the photographs and video that all your fans love to see. It'll be on there little by little. They'll love it. And they'll be able to buy some merchandise, too, right? We talked about that, right? Yes, we have uh, duplicate pairs of Robin Gibbons underwear, so they're going to be going really quick. <laughs> yeah, and and the, and the actual still shot of Mike Tyson's look on his face when Robert Gibbons, Gibbons threw him under the bus on the Robert Walters show—that's got to be worth something, right? I've got a, I've got them in the locker room before they went out. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, great job. Have a great holiday. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Okay, thanks, Billy. Bye. All right, that's Steve Lott, and uh, you just heard uh, In the Ring with Billy C. and Steve Lott. And I promise that as soon as Steve sends me uh, uh, the stuff, uh, we're going to put uh, a link right up to uh, his uh, Hall of Fame in Las Vegas. It's called the Las Vegas Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, we are going to have a grand opening on that. Uh, it is open now, but uh, we're going to have a uh, grand opening on the boxing end. Uh, I believe... Uh, Tony Treen was telling me uh, in February. So look forward to that. We'll keep you posted on all that, all that stuff. And uh, right now, I got to take a break. I'll be right back. <laughs> 